Right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week and it is then posted to our website in our archives. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can um, access all of our archives. Both the live show and the recorded archives are free and open to, to anyone to watch. So please do share um, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, here in the Nebraska Library Commission, we are the state agency for libraries in Nebraska. Uh, similar to your state library. Um, and so we serve all types of libraries in the state, anything. Um, so you will find things on our show for publics, uh, academic, K-12, uh, correction facilities, museums, archives, anything that's a library, that's really our only uh, criteria for having them on the show is something libraries are doing, something libraries could be doing, uh, something that we think they might be interested in, uh, cool new services and products that are out there we do. Um, we bring in guest speakers sometimes on Tan Compass Live to share what's going on in libraries across Nebraska and across the country, um, and even outside of, Nebraska, of the country. Um, and we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations about things that are uh, more local, things that we're doing here um, via the Nebraska Library Commission services and programs that we offer. Um, and today we have kind of a mixture of that. Today I am, as I said, I am the host of Encompass Live, and usually I am just the host. Um, guiding things and making the show, the show run. But today I am also your, one of your presenters. Ta -da. I do do this. <laughs> um, innovation on a shoestring, free and cheap tools is our topic for today. And with me is my colleague Louise. Hi Louise, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Louise Alcorn. I am the Technology Services Coordinator at the West Des Moines, Iowa Public Library. And um, we have together been doing this presentation, um, we think, for 10 or 12 years. We haven't really looked back. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're a little afraid to look we at that. Yeah. Um, but Louise and I both work a lot with um, all sizes of libraries, obviously I do. Um, and especially ones in Nebraska, at least, most of our libraries are small, rural, um, uh, population served 5,000 or less, um, leaning you know, more towards that size, and are um, always looking for ways to do things in their job, in their, at their libraries. They need something easy, something not too expensive, uh, something they can take on themselves. And Louise, you do a similar kind of thing um, through your library, correct? Yeah, and actually, although I'm at actually a, a growing suburban medium to large library now, um, I have long uh, uh, helped with the Iowa libraries and basically we have I think I think Nebraska outstrips us but we have like 535 or 540 something small public libraries uh, in this actually state. No, you guys have more than we do do we okay we have right. like 500 and whatever you said public libraries right. we have like 274 public libraries oh well there we go so yeah we, we have, have more open libraries. spaces I guess we have more open spaces with our, we have more population too and so. things like that yeah yeah, and and the problem is everybody spread out. Everybody is uh, very individualized, you know. But they may be serving five thousand, they may be serving a thousand, they may be serving five hundred. Uh, mm -hmm. But everybody has many of the same problems. So a lot of what we're dealing with today is trying to find really cool tools for them to use to just try, and it's you know low entry try. So it's not you're, you're not spending a lot of money to give this thing a whirl uh, and see if it works for you. Yeah, and so we started researching this on behalf of our, you know, it's something we did anyways for the libraries and decided this is something we need to share with more people. So we presented at various conferences over the years, and I did say we've been doing this for 10 to 12 years. It is updated, <laughs> so don't, yeah. this is not 10 year old resources, this is ones that we found within the last month or two, um, more current things, so, so it is as perpetually updated. Um, so I'll also let you know too, right here at the beginning, that um, all of the uh, resources and things we're going to mention here today, at the very end, there's a final slide where I've put into my Digo account um, of the links to all of the different uh, resources that we're going to share with you today. So don't worry about trying to write down um, all of the URLs for everything. Um, just take notes on how you might use it maybe 
Um, you'll have access to that at the end. Um, the, the slides as, as well are already posted up to Louise's um, SlideShare account. So you'll be able to get these slides as well um, afterwards. So um, you'll have all the information at the end um, for that, along with the um, archive recording when that's done. So um, just sit back, relax, and let's get started. I'm going to make our presentation uh, front and center here. So there, so you should just see the slides now, correct? Mm -hmm. Awesome, all right. So free and cheap tools. Um, in our libraries, uh, we've mentioned small and rural, but actually all sizes of libraries, really. Um, we all are struggling with the same things. Uh, money, not enough, none. <laughs> not enough to be able to buy and pay for some of these more high um, expensive resources and services that are out there. Um, not enough time to investigate, look at what's out there, find out what kind of resource things might be available, what tools I could use in my library to do my job better, either um, for me as a, as a staff person or for my patrons for them to use. And not enough staff to do these things, not enough staff to um, work on these things and figure out which ones are the best ones to use. Um, we both mentioned in Nebraska and Iowa, small rural libraries, small staffs. Um, but even in the larger libraries, there are staffing issues. I know, Louise, you've mentioned that at your library. Yeah, we're, um, <laughs> despite the fact that we're serving like well over 60,000 people, um, we have a staff that is more appropriate to about 25,000 population served. So we're about 30 to 50 percent understaffed at all times. Yeah, so it's, <clears throat> it's the same all everywhere. So uh, this is really was um, part of our reason for you know working on these things for you. We have done the research for for you guys. Looked at the good the, re the things that are out there. Um, hopefully weeded out the ones that are not so good, don't meet our criteria, don't aren't as helpful, aren't as easy to use. Um, everything in this presentation as well uh, also does have a free option. Yes. Um, some of them have paid. Um, features and things that may you know you might need to pay for to get what you might want to use it for but right off the bat everything does have something you can do that will be completely free <clears throat> so first Louise We'll yeah, the, bo the boring stuff, uh, except that it's it's increasingly the important stuff. Um, so the, the basics are, and I'm not going to go through a lot of deep stuff, but the basics are that we are largely dealing with, in fact, we're entirely dealing with services that are web-based, and many of them have a social media component. And by which I mean, you know, you go to this site, oh, this is really cool. Oh, I can log in with Facebook. I can log in with Google, or I can create my own email and password and log in that way. You know, you're all familiar with that if you've gone to basically any kind of, of web tool at all. But we need to remember that social media is social. There is much that is shared. Um, I The quote I have here, I think is from, yes, yeah, from Hootsuite. Um, so things like it may include information, names, photos, age, gender, blah, blah, blah. But you know that there's a lot more data going through than that. Now, you can be absolutely fine with that. Um, it's just that you want to be aware, and especially if you're then recommending these to patrons, you want to be aware of what you're recommending to them. Um, next slide. Um, the uh, I always kind of give a little caveat that if you're using another social media account to log into the platform, they also share across. So basically, Google and Facebook are also sharing with, say, Canva or you know any of these other ones. And again, as long as you're aware of that. Sometimes you can opt out of some things. You can opt out of some of the marketing usually, but you can't necessarily opt out of the actual sharing of the information unless you just basically don't use the account or delete the account. So just be aware of that and, and make sure that, for instance, with small libraries, we have a tendency to use our personal accounts to first try these out. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Make a library account <laughs> on any of these and especially use a library account of uh, like have a library Google account, have a library Facebook account mm -hmm. and use those to go across. That way you're at least being consistent. Okay. Right. And what's that's great, boring, is, like I said, with all of these things being free, that's okay. You're not putting in any, you don't need to get any like payment information or pay card information, create a card from your, from your library. You can just have a generic one that costs nothing to explore with. Yeah. 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 And it's a good idea. And if it doesn't work out for your library, you cancel it and go on and find something else. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And just go delete the account. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So. All right, we're going to start with uh, graphic design, um, which sounds very fancy, but again, all of us, all of us, every library ever of every size has to make flyers, bookmarks, handouts, and of course, many, many, many web posts. 
why did we go back? Okay. Um, no, we're all good. Let's just start on Splash. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, only Krista can control the presentation at the moment. So we're kind of, we're playing this a little freehand. So bear with us. Okay. Um, all of us are looking for great stuff. Um, I assume many of you have discovered Pixabay, which is one of our favorite sites for getting um, uh, mostly free content. Um, and which is lovely. Uh, I actually use Pixabay all the time, but a lot of the people creating the content on there may be amateurs putting stuff up. Unsplash is kind of a neat new thing. Um, a graphic designer that we know, a couple of graphic designers we know, uh, mentioned this to us as a place where they go and get actual professional work. Basically what you're getting is B-roll. So basically a photographer's taken a whole lot of photos. They, they take the few that they want and they then may upload their, their B-roll shots, which are still beautiful and professional and gorgeous. And they put them on Unsplash. And this is the great part. It's, you know, it's searchable and all of that kind of thing. Um, although some of the keywords are amusing because of course this is not librarians putting this together. Uh, <laughs> but it is truly freely available. And we'll talk about the, um, the terms of service here in just a second. Um, so I want to show you an example of a search. So I just searched for libraries because, of course, that's what we always search for when we go and test a site. Um, and I found a few things I liked and I found one. I thought, OK, let me grab this one and see basically what happens. I, what I love is it says pile of brown books. That's his actual <laughs> caption. And I'm like, well, first of all, I'm a librarian and that's not a pile. That's a shelf <laughs> and it's in order. And yeah, whatever. OK, so. <laughs> um, you have to kind of deal with the fact that it's it's done by folksonomy, which is basically people tagging it themselves. Um, but what's nice is if you go and you decide you want to download this, you'll go here and you'll see up in the left where it says Paulina B. This is the person who actually created it. And you can download this. And when you go to download, it's going to say, um, you're absolutely welcome to download this for free and use it as you like. That's the other thing, which we'll get to that in a minute. But they, you don't have to credit them. But it's obviously, if you can, if it's if somewhere on your flyer or somewhere on your web post, you can make a tiny link to um, mm -hmm. the content and help them out. That's just fine. But you do not have to. Uh, these are made freely available, and they understand that when they upload them. There are some limitations about using things that have copyrights, which I'll show you that page in a minute. But it's pretty straightforward. I actually am very impressed with their terms of service. Mm -hmm. In fact, let's take a look at those. Um, I'm, I want to read this to you just super quick. Unsplash grants you an irrevocable, non-exclusive, worldwide copyright license to download, copy, modify, distribute, perform, and use photos from Unsplash for free, including for commercial purposes, without permission from or attributing the photographer. Now, obviously, don't be a jerk. And if you can uh, give them credit, do so, obviously. Uh, I just realized sometimes on a bookmark or sometimes on a, on a small flyer, you may just not have space really to give them credit, or you may just put Unsplash you know, or something like that on there. Um, do your best, obviously, because you don't want to be a jerk about it. Um, but it is really nice that we can use this because especially in libraries, we, we, you know, we don't have a lot of money to be spending to buy, you know, to buy a lot of paid um, photography content, but we do want professional things that look professional whenever possible. Because frankly, clip art has had its day and we're kind of done. <laughs> Um, because now, now that we can do other things we do, um, there are some limitations, like I said, about the, the unsplash license does not include the right to use blah, 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 you know, trademarks, logos, um, people's, and that's the other things you won't find a lot of people in these photos. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the limitations of the, um, that the photographers are told when they put stuff up, but that's fine. We don't want that anyways. Yeah. Not recognizable. Like I've seen not some like I mean, from you can behind have, like, or they're in face, shadow or something. Yeah, the back yeah. of somebody's ponytail, you know, whatever. Yeah. Or the artsy so, type things, which are kind of cool yeah. to use. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So mm -hmm. anyway, so um, there are some limitations, but that's fine. Those are all limitations that you would want anyways. And the fact that they do the work for you to some extent is very nice. So that's a very nice service. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of what to then do with all of those lovely photos, Canva is one of my favorites. I'm sure many of you have heard of Canva. Uh, it's fantastic. It's very simple to use, and this is why I recommend it. There's also a free version that is still quite, quite robust. Um, and in fact, you can get a nonprofit version. And I have heard of several libraries getting it. Some of them got it via their friends group, and they share it with their friends group for usage. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's been a little bit unclear as to whether you have to use the friends group as your quote nonprofit, but I think a lot of libraries have just ended up using it with no problem. Yeah, and that's something um, with the, I think many of the resources we're talking about today that I tend to thought about. Yeah, the nonprofit, each service you'll have to read into what they need from you to prove you are a nonprofit, and if it has to be that you are an official 501c3, 
have yeah have your friends or foundation do it and then you can use it for the library yeah yeah, yeah and they do allow you to share that on so since the since the work of the foundation is the work of the library in many ways so um that they have no problem with okay again they have lots of pre-made designs why do i like this because i have zero time i think i mentioned we're 30 to 50 percent understaffed <laughs> i have at most five minutes to make a graphic to put out on the web in fact uh we're about to do a giant reno and i had to come up with like six images last night in about an hour and a half um <laughs> Yeah, Canva was real helpful. Um, okay, so you basically get a basic template. So here's one, and I'm going to just show you my one minute graphic. Okay, granted, I should have taken five, but here's one minute graphic. So I take this basic template. And I'm like, well, that's great, but it's not autumn. Okay, it is autumn now. But when I was doing it, it wasn't autumn, and that's not what I was trying to do. But I really like the font. I am not good with fonts. I'm not good with figuring out which fonts go with other which fonts. I really like graphic designers to do that for me. So mm -hmm. then what I did was I took a photo that I had access to of a bunny. Hello, bunny. Mm -hmm. And I basically changed the one word to spring and the other one to because bunnies. And there I have a graphic. Now, granted, I, it was a one minute graphic so I cut off the poor bunny's ears and I also <laughs> cut off the bottom of spring but again this was literally in a minute I threw this together I then made a couple of small adjustments which took me another four minutes <laughs> and then and the thing is that I was unable to save it as a web enabled image so basically something that was really good to be putting out on Facebook and then another version that was really good because I have a couple of spaces on my website where I have to have tiny 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 things and they have to still be quite visible um, mm -hmm. so I was able to do all of those changes in Canva in a matter of minutes boom done another thing that they have that we really like and a few of our friends have done this so I'm going to show you some examples of some of the really quite beautiful templates they have so this was done by some some buddies of ours uh, for various things, this was done for just basically to show off the um, a new learning commons that they created. Another one was done for bibliographic instruction or book club or something. I, it's really beautiful. And again, this was all templates. And I love this, the one on the right, because believe it or not, that's a template. Mm -hmm. So somebody had already come up with this sort of old timey thing that they did for this, this very fine um, historical. You just uh, have to put in your own text. Yep, you just put in your own text and your own images and that's fantastic. So one of the great things though is that not only can you do web capable and like, you know, for my website I have to have these little tiny things that are nicely sized and blah, blah, blah. You also can do ones that are capable to send to a printer to do those big banners. You know, every once in a while you've got a big event and you got to do one of those big banners and you actually have the money to spend from your friend's foundation or something for a big banner. So we're going to show you an example of one of them. So this is, again, for that um, learning commons. And this is our friend's daughter, Gwen, to give you a life-size uh, <laughs> idea of how big this is. That's lovely, Gwen. Yeah, uh, the daughter yeah. of the woman who did this, the director yes. of the Sydney Potsdam uh, Lowy Center for Applied Learning. Yep. Yeah, she basically sent it to us as to give us a, an idea of scale also because Gwen's cute. So, uh, but again, all of this was done in Canva. This was not, you did, they did not have to have professional graphic design. It was done in Canva, but then sent to a professional printer to print. But that's certainly, certainly less money that you're spending uh, than if you actually had to have it designed by them as well. So that's just a really nice thing that that offers that, that level of scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another one that's really good is PictoChart. Uh, PictoChart's fun. Um, basically, as you know, nobody reads anymore. Okay, that's not true. But but nobody reads reports anymore. They expect to have pretty graphs and pretty pictures to explain to them visually. And a lot of people really do understand concepts better visually. Um, I know that when when I just recently improved a graph on something that we've been sending to the board for years and just improving the way it looked, like we didn't change any data, just improved the way it looked, they were like, oh, now we get it. Now we understand what you're trying to tell us. Oh, that's really cool. That's fantastic growth. Yay, you. And again, you want a lot of yay use from your board, so this is a great tool to use. So again, they have a free uh, version, they do have paid versions, they have an educational version and nonprofit pricing. So all of these are possible. They're not, none of them are terrible. They're like $15, $20 a month at most, but I think quite a bit less than that in many cases. Again, professional templates. So it's basically a Canva for infographics, if you think of it that way. And again, you can also do presentations and flyers. So here's some examples of ones. I'm just kind of throwing these out there. These were very random, uh, but again, they're very nice and you just put your own text in there. Um, so they've already done all the cutesy things for you, and it's just a matter of you figuring out how to take your data and put it in there. The other thing is you can actually upload data from spreadsheets uh, to do charts and infographics and so forth if they're like kind of chart-based. So I as if that. you would do an Excel, yeah, as if you were doing Excel, but basically that um, does a lot of the work for you. Putting in all the numbers for you is awesome, yeah. Right. Right. So, um, and that's nice. So you just have some raw data and you want to kind of make it pretty. This is, this is at least a way to start uh, making it pretty without having to suddenly learn advanced Excel. So, yeah. All right. Okay. 
All right, next up is um, events and meeting room management. Uh, there are lots of different services out there that you can use to um, do this kind of thing. Uh, some of the ones I know you've used some, Louise, that are for pay. Yes, I've, uh, I, over the years I've used like Evanced, we're now using Library mm -hmm. Market, there's uh, Communico, there's a whole bunch of ones out there wow. that are uh, from low to giganto prices. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And quite, and quite um, powerful. Right, but there are ways to do this where it doesn't have to cost you anything and um, you can just do it on your own in-house. And uh, Google is one that I have found that um, libraries are using that is um, really slick. Uh, Google has um, forms, online forms people can use to submit information to you, whether it's signing up for a session, a program, or um, picking, signing up for meeting room space, something like that, plus Sheets, which is their version of spreadsheets of Excel and a calendar feature and with all three of these things together you can create some really robust and useful um, you just link them all together to um, do both registering for events at your library and keeping track of all that when you create a Google form it automatically creates a Google sheet well that will then gather all of the information about who signed up for your for your event um, or you can have it feed into um, a calendar out to, so if you have people registering to either put programming into your library or to book a meeting room for their own purposes, uh, to use a room, um, you can have it, it'll feed into a spreadsheet for that and keep track of it. And then for your events, these can actually feed out of this form and sheet into a online calendar so you can have it posted on your website showing here's everything going on in the library this month. Um, this is the case is what Louise said earlier that do not use your personal account. No, 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 no. Because <laughs> um, then it will be connected to you as a person. Create a Gmail account for your library. Uh, my, you know, so and so public library at gmail.com and use that one for all of the stuff that is library related for you. Uh, anyone using it, your your patrons, anyone reserving a room, signing up for a session, do not have to have their own Google account to access any of this or submit anything onto your online forms. So um, that's great. They don't have to worry about having their own account. Just you, as the library who created all of these, has to have one. Um, and something else that is we've noticed there is sometimes a limit to in some of these services is. Uh, for free at least, how many questions you can ask on a form, how many responses you can receive from some of these. And with Google, it's unlimited. They do not have any limit on that on you. So some of these free resources are, are or where the cheaper versions of some of these bigger products have these limits. With Google, you don't have to worry about it. So here's an example of creating a new calendar in Google. Once you have your account set up in here, you just go to um, my calendars and you see I've got one here for meeting room, um, keep track of birthdays, I guess. Now this is in my own personal account, of course, which is, um, so don't do that, but there's a create a new calendar option here that you would use to um, set up the, the new, um, whatever it's gonna be, it's gonna be for a particular event, it's gonna be for your meeting room reservation calendar. Um, you'd name it whatever you want. And then you can go in and create the Google form for it under in your Google Drive, which is part of your whole Google account. Google has a whole suite of things. Um, you see there's their documents, sheets, slides is their presentations um, product. Um, but under the Google Forms, you can do a blank one from scratch, but they also have templates. We love the templates for all these things. Anything that's already pre-made and we can just edit is awesome. Saves you so much. To be clear, we are essentially lazy and looking for other people to work for us. <laughs> Borrow so. and use and share. Borrow, use. Do. <laughs> so here's one. This is a template um, for event registration. Nothing's been done to it yet. This is just the default. And you can see, even see the background. It looks kind of museum, library-ish, sure. But you can change that photo to be anything you want. Um, create your, your um, online form. Enter all the information that you need in it depending on what you're using it for if you're using it for registering for an event for an event or a program you'd ask for the appropriate information for that if it's for a meeting room reservation you'd ask for you know what's your event which contact info what hours do you want um, what you can do for a um, meeting room registration which is great is in your calendar for that meeting room that you've created you can block off time when they can't reserve the room by creating your own event quote unquote for example, from like, you know, 10 p.m. to 9, you know, 9 a.m. So you don't want people trying to reserve your meeting room for a 2 a.m. whatever kind of meeting. 
<laughs> so you block off that with it that it's already reserved and then they only have the time from when you're actually you're at, at open hours to be able to reserve a room. Um, but once you've got this done, you see here there is a there's actually a um, what's it called a plugin for Google that you can go out and get an add in that is to export from form to calendar. So it's a little extra bit you have to install into your Google account here. And once you do that, based on what people are entering into that form, it automatically pre-populates this calendar, which you then can get the code for to post on your website. So you can see this library here, it says it's a Google calendar, and that's where all of this is coming from. So it can be publicly out there for your um, people who are coming to your library to submit the forms and put it in there, or you can um, uh, preview what they've asked for to put on your calendar before it goes public, you know, so intercept them, so not just random things end up on your calendar for events or, or meeting rooms, but it can all be spit right out there into a nice uh, slick calendar on your library's website so everyone can see what's going on. Uh, something else that can be done with Google Forms, which is, you know, that was a pretty basic, most forms people think of just asking questions. You can get a little more creative with it, too. Uh, this is one that someone here in Nebraska has done. Um, in Nebraska, we have, for those of you who don't know, the Golden Sower Awards, which are Children's Literary Choice Awards. The kids pick them. And they did a, um, added for each of the questions, added a little uh book cover of each of the books they wanted to ask about. Which of the five most recent book winners was your favorite? So you can get a little more creative with the forms too. So um, definitely recommend exploring Google. The, the forms and sheets and calendar connections are really nice and really slick and um, can make you get some really like um, professional, easy looking things out on your library's website. And we always love to look super professional even when we're like, nope, I have a minute and a half to get this done. Let me Let me see what I can do. So, okay, now all of us, I'm assuming even at the smallest libraries, we have at least some basic social media presence. I know that we've got tiny, tiny libraries that nonetheless have at least a basic website, have possibly a Facebook page, and in fact, often their Facebook page is more busy than their uh, their basic website. So mm -hmm. we want to make sure that what we're doing out there makes sense, but we also want to make sure that we are watching what goes on. So there's all, all sorts of services available, and I don't even know if all of these are still alive. That's the other thing about social media is some of them um, have a tendency to disappear. Um, I tried to grab the biggies here. Um, but we all want ways to wrangle this social media to make sure that we are being consistent with our message, that we're getting things out in a timely manner, if at all possible to schedule it ahead. That's a big thing for us. We have, um, I have a Facebook, we have a main Facebook page. We have a Facebook page for the Friends Foundation, which I help to manage. And then we have three Twitter feeds. Plus, we've got an Instagram that we're just not using very much. That's mostly for the teen uh, folks, the youth services folks. Um, so here's a few tools to uh, help you wrangle some of this at least. Um, one of the ones I use all the time is TweetDeck. TweetDeck is owned by Twitter. Uh, it didn't used to be, but it is now. And it is free, it's absolutely free, uh, uh, web-based feed management. So basically if you have, especially if you have more than one Twitter feed, but even if you have a Twitter feed, I actually use it to manage both my personal and the professional all in one place, which I like. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be very careful about what you're putting where, um, but I always am, I'm always super double, triple check uh, before I send something out. Um, because uh, I actually help manage a bunch of nonprofits as well. So I have a lot of stuff that I'm, I'm dealing with. But even if you just have one, it's nice to use this as a um, as a tool just to kind of make sure you know what's going on. So again, multiple Twitter accounts can be managed. You don't have to. Um, you can not only do see the feeds, but also uh, if you want to search and follow a hashtag. So for instance, if you're having a little mini con or a, like a little mini conference or something at your library and you have created a hashtag for it you could actually be following that or if your city or town is doing a special thing and has a hashtag for it you could follow that and make sure that you as the library are being part of that conversation because again as we all know I actually just took a whole bunch of sessions at community engagement at the last two conferences I was at, and I've, I've got lots of ideas sparking in my head. And one of the things is to just be super present, not only in physical spaces, which is a thing that we struggle with because of low staff, but also in the virtual spaces to make sure that we're out there and that we're answering. Like if, if we get somebody replies that we like it or that we reply to it, um, that we're not just putting stuff out unidirectionally. And, you and something else you can do like, is that I, I that I always forget about, but I've done it now that you mentioned the keeping in touch with what's going on in your town. Um, you can tra track certain hashtags, but you can also track. Um, 
um, follow a location because yeah. if people are using Twitter and they have said where they are, you can set up a thing to track anyone commenting or posting from your town. I have one set up for um, Lincoln has a hashtag, hashtag LNK, but I also have a separate thing where I'm tracking just anybody mentioning or who are located in Lincoln, Nebraska. So it brings me up some, some of the same things, but some different things too. And that's a, and that's a great thing for especially in a small town if somebody is mentioning it. I mean, you you want to make sure to gather those, respond to those, you know, and especially if they're positive, maybe even even repost them. Um, so I want to show you what TweetDeck looks like. It's uh, pretty straightforward. Again, you'll see this format in some of the other tools that we show you as well. It clearly is the preferred format. Um, you'll see it repeated again and again, but this is the basics. And so again, we've got, and this happens to be um, Krista's. <laughs> so yes. we got Krista's, but we also have the uh, Nebraska Library Commission feed. We have notifications that came through um, for the for the Nebraska Library Commission. Again, you can follow various things and each one opens a different one of these columns. You can move these columns around, you can open and close them. It's very easy. You can also, again, if you have multiple accounts, they'll actually all show up down there. Uh, and when you go to tweet, this is what I really like. When you go to tweet, it actually asks you which account are you tweeting from which again mm -hmm. keeps me from being an idiot that is very <laughs> yeah. important okay so and, um, some other ones to talk about um, Hootsuite is a very fine one but it is it, it's free versions are really kind of limited um, mm -hmm. but it is so powerful it may be worth taking a look at mm -hmm. um, it has great interface and it does not just Twitter but also Facebook and I think Instagram and a few others multiple account management. Um, sorry, there is a 30 day free trial for all of the pricing plans and they do still have that. We, we literally just checked mm -hmm. this like within the last week because somebody at the last conference said, oh I, no, you have to pay. Yeah, well, I checked, I, checked, me, I double checked on Monday that this is the current status. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so we did double check on this and, but, and there are some free plans and I'll show you there's, if you have just one primary social media person, it, so a one quote login, for small organizations, their free plan is available. And that's actually a big thing because if you're in a small library, even if there's two or three of you who actually do post, you can all use the same account to post. Mm -hmm. So it's actually totally manageable. It's when you get into bigger organizations and you really do have multiple, like you have like the children's department does their own separate or the teen department does their own separate. I mean, that that's where you get, it's more complicated and Hootsuite then has some paid options. But if you're that big, you could probably afford the you know, 15 or $20 a month at that point. Okay, um, so let me show you a little bit. Again, you can connect up all sorts of profiles. Uh, who the heck uses LinkedIn for their library? I don't know, but go with God. Everything else um, is. Okay, yeah, then and that is, again, uh, from a single account. This is, again, you'll notice this looks very familiar. This is the various streams that you're going through. You got timeline, you've got the various posts you've done, you've done the mentions, the likes. Again, and you'll see that the one with the little flag, that's Facebook pages. So again, most of us have a page for our library as opposed to necessarily an account per se. So we have a page, then it's got the various, um, uh, you know, likes and I mean, it, this can go on for a while. You can actually, it, you can actually have this be quite a lot of columns. I tend to keep it open to just sort of the essentials and then just check other things as I need to. Um, so again, the interface is fairly straightforward. Um, this again is the pricing. I'm not going to go through this really deeply. I do want to point out down at the bottom where it says try our limited free plan. So again, three profiles. So that would be like Facebook, Twitter, and maybe one other or Facebook and a couple of Twitters, whatever. It's not a lot. So if you have more than that, this is not something going to work. And then 30 scheduled messages. Scheduling, this is the big deal. Both um, TweetDeck and Hootsuite allow you to schedule ahead. Mm -hmm. your tweets. Why is this important? Well, right now, uh, as I think I mentioned earlier, we're about to start a giant renovation. We've been waiting 24 years for this. Uh, <laughs> they're not doing much, but they, we've been waiting 24 years for this. We're going to close for two weeks. You can just imagine the giant PR headache that that is. So we have been prepping the waters for the last several weeks, in fact, several months, letting people know this was coming. In order to do this, I wanted to make sure to spread them out. So I scheduled them ahead on Facebook, on Twitter, on various other things to make sure, and obviously our website, which we do separately, um, to make sure that all of this got out in a timely manner, but that wasn't piling up on top of each other. And it's mostly worked. We've got pretty good goodwill going into this. We also had a giant book sale that we brought you know, thousands of people too. So that really helped as well. All of that done with scheduling on very I also use scheduling myself for when I know I'm not going to be around to post something on the appropriate date or time. Either I'm going on vacation, yeah. but I can still have my reminders and posts and things go out. Or if I'm going to be attending a conference, as I was last week at our local 
Nebraska and Iowa State Conference. Um, I couldn't get onto a computer when we wanted to put things out, but we were able to pre-schedule things. So we were still um, communicating and interacting on our social media uh, by having these things scheduled to go out. Yeah, and I do that, for instance, when holidays are coming up, so I make sure, I actually have a, a tickler in my calendar a couple of months ahead to make sure to schedule those, the reminders about when we're going to be closed, reminders about, you know, what you can do with your items if you need to return them, uh, and then those can off, you know, often go out while I'm, you know, out of town or, you know, driving to eat turkey or whatever the heck I'm doing. So, okay, now those two are, well, let me talk about this. There is a nonprofit discount um, that you can apply for with Hootsuite. I did just recently communicate with them. So I was like, okay, would a library qualify as a nonprofit or would we have to use our Friends Foundation? I literally asked them this like three times and they're like, fill out the application. Fill out the application. We'll, we'll let you know. <laughs> let, let, me, let me, yeah, let me finish. So th they basically told me to fill out the application. So the answer is I don't know, except that I know that several libraries have managed to get it. So um, my guess is probably it might just be the person that you get. But again, if you have a Friends Foundation that can just do that for you and you get a 50% off of the professional, so you're still going to pay some, but you're going to pay half what you otherwise would have paid. So if you're just going for like the $29 a month, it would then be like more like 15 Again, all, all manageable. Again, the free version, if you've got a fairly small library, is probably sufficient for you. It's a good product. Anyhow, these are two that we suggested, but there's one I really want to bring up for everybody. This is Zoho Social. Now, we've been talking about Zoho's products for a long time. They have a, an enormous suite of fully online, wonderful products, including for productivity, for project management, for all sorts of stuff. Well, they have a very nice social media wrangling product called Zoho Social. It's robust. It's affordable. Um, you can schedule unlimited posts. So unlike with Hootsuite, where we just saw you could only have 30 scheduled posts, and that's, I, I think that's per month, but it was a little unclear about that too, <laughs> which is kind of amusing. Again, I think once you apply, you can find out exactly what you get. Um, and again, you can manage multiple social channels of various kinds. You don't get quite the breadth of channel possibilities as you did with Hootsuite. So if you really do have a LinkedIn that you use, you would be able to pull that in. But, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know, the biggies are all going to be in there. Um, they do have free and cheap options. So let me show you, though, because the interface is, looks fairly straightforward. The, the, again, this, the plan, they have a genuine free plan. It's genuinely free. Again, it's one login. So again, you'd have to kind of figure out how you want to manage that. But again, if you just have a library login, multiple people could potentially use that. Facebook, Twitter, I guess I do have LinkedIn, that's right. Uh, Google My Business, Instagram, those are the ones that are available. And by the way, those are available for all of them. They don't cheat you on any of that. Um, there's various things they allow, you can just allow them to do. This was for the public library. I was setting it up to try to see what I wanted it to do. So again, access your pages, do all that kind of stuff. Um, you can invite people to work on it. This is kind of interesting because you're like, but we just have one login. Well, you can invite people to work on it as like basic editors or basic users and just do some posts. So there, that's another way to expand your team. And the thing is that maybe what you only give them is for just Twitter, like basically, let's say you your teen person only wants to do your teen Twitter feed and not worry about Facebook or anything like that. You could do that, or they just do the Instagram, or they just do whatever. So that's actually kind of nice too. You can kind of manage that. That's always good to have. Um, this is one thing I really like. So uh, again, it's there is that version with the columns, <laughs> just like all the others. But the other thing is I like this interface because off to the right you'll see, and I hope hopefully it's not covered up with your little um, uh, chat. No. Thing. Yeah. Um, it's the, it tells you where you published it. So for instance, I just did a bunch of posts here just to kind of show you, but so I used TweetDeck on a couple of them and I used Twitter itself on another one and I did Facebook to send out another one. So even if you're not necessarily using the Zoho social to do all the posting at that time, you can manage where you sent stuff from and when you sent it and also how much it engaged people. So, you know, how much are people getting feedback on that? So I really like that. Again, you can also do scheduled posts. You can do draft posts. I love doing that because I'm like, mm -hmm. let me just make up these six posts. I know I'm going to need to go out in the next month and I'll just deal with them later when it's actually time to send them out. Um, I like to do that work ahead. Again, look at the columns. <laughs> you look very familiar. Everybody's using the same column thing. And it really does work. I really find it very useful to just do a quick scan over and be like, okay, this is what we've got. That's a Twitter feed. That's our Google business. I actually like the fact that they added Google My Business in here because actually that's something I have to follow because for some people here, for some reason here in my town, people are crazy for Google and do a lot of nasty comments on Google that I have to respond to because people I don't know um, and we also have an Instagram account so that's that's another thing that's uh, kind of nice to be able to follow in there 
So I really do like it, and it's genuinely free and genuinely useful and genuinely fully web-based, which is really nice. I love Zoho, yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. So there we go. All right. So next up, online learning. Um, many of you have, I'm sure, heard about the lynda.com debacle recently, where they were giving out private information, sharing private information with LinkedIn because they got purchased by LinkedIn. Well, they got purchased years ago, a few years ago, but they finally made the stronger connection. And that was a, a, uh, a big problem for libraries, obviously. It was totally against all of our policies and things about patron um, privacy. So um, many libraries actually did um, cancel their lynda.com um, accounts uh, because out of like, no, we're not, whoops, we're not doing this. We are not going to be um, whoops, participating in this uh, and doing this to our, to our patrons. So what do you do instead? There are lots of other options. There are some free ones. Some I know that you've um, used at your library that you've um, interacted with, Louise. Sorry, I muted because I was blowing my nose. <laughs> <laughs> This is how you know we're live. Um, yeah. yeah, actually, uh, I actually been playing around with the Khan Academy recently, but we've also done the, some of the fee ones, like the Learning Express. We got that through the state mm -hmm. for years, and we'd yeah. actually been getting it before that, and now we're getting it again on our own because it's just fantastic for um, like SAT prep, ACT prep. All right. that so there's a lot of options out there. Yeah, but there's, there's an enormous number. We're actually using. We now have Universal Class. Who knew it? Because we didn't want to go with Linda because we had other issues with them, like the fact that they were four times as expensive as everybody yeah. else. So we yeah. ended up going with Who knew it and Universal Class and Learn It Live. And people have been fairly pleased with them. But it's mm -hmm. like they're all they all have good and bad. They all have different lists of classes. So it's yeah. kind of a patchwork at the it best is. of times. Um, and I've come across in in my research and some things that I've done some free options out there as well that are just great. Um, so if you want, but these are some very good ones. Khan Academy is a well-known one um, for free, for everyone, forever. And that is true. There is no cost for anything to, to do in Khan Academy. Um, there's online tutorials, um, exercises to take you through things to test yourself. Uh, they do focus on certain certain subjects. And that's the thing, too, about a lot. Of, um, there's no one, as Louise was just describing with even the pay ones that they do, there's really no one-stop shopping for everything online learning you might want to do. You're going to have to put things together depending on what people are looking for, whether it's your own staff looking for um, learning and education or your patrons. So Khan Academy has great things for math, science, economics, the gut into the arts and humanities, lots of great computing, test prep on here. All of their training tutorials are free and open out there, and you do not have to create an account to use them. You don't even have to give them. So that was one thing a lot of people were worried about with Linda is what about my info? You can use everything on their website for free if you want to, however, or without an account at all, without a profile or anything. However, if you want to keep track of what you're doing, they do have a learning dashboard. So you would then have to create a profile in there, and then it will track what you're doing. And you can see as you're moving along through the different sections of, of training, how you've advanced. Um, if you need to uh, prove to an employer, maybe, or one of your, your patrons need to prove to somebody, I, yes, I did take this class, and here's the official certification, or here's where you can see that I did it, you'll need to have that um, profile set up and that learning dashboard tracking everything. So if you do want to track that, you would have to create something, but you don't have to. They also have just this year, I believe it was, came out with Khan Academy Kids. Um, and this is great. This is actually specifically for the the real littles, two to six, ages two to six, um, a whole bunch of educational things for kids. They have these little, you can see the little animated um, animals there in their video. Um, this is an app, of course, um, on various devices. And they are very, very specific and, and, and strong about privacy, especially with related to children. Khan Academy actually is part of the Student Privacy Pledge signatory where they will keep um, safeguard students' information, anyone under age 13. So you see here they've got their privacy principles here. Um, we'll keep things safe and secure for anyone. There's extra precautions for anyone under 13. Um, we can restrict the childhood accounts. Um, so that the kids can't even share their own personal information out there. So, you know, as a parent, someone could go in and take care of that. So Khan Academy is great for um, the things for anyone who's some um, underage, and they have lots of great resources out there. The people who create the coursework there are experts in their fields. Um, so they find people who know these things and create the different courses. Here's one about um, the scale of the large science. So you can see how it fits into the um, hierarchy of the education there, science, cosmology, and 
astronomy, scale of the universe, and you start with large, small, and you can work your way through all of these um, things here. There are videos. There is, you can see at the bottom there, this is actually a transcript of the video. So for anyone who is um, unable to hear it, uh, they do have that in there. So that's awesome. And you just go step by step and work your way through learning and building upon your previous um, learning. Uh, they also do some gamification of some of their um, uh, tutorials and education. Uh, this one, High School Geometry, you see here you can earn mastery points. So you can compete with yourself or with your friends, <laughs> maybe if the kids want to do that. Um, once again, if you didn't want to keep track of what you've been doing, of course, you have to have that you know profile set up in there so you can you know have it uh, save everything you've done, but you know, gives you a little something to work for as you're taking these quizzes. Um, you'll see how many points you've earned if you want to go back and get a better score or something. So Khan Academy is a great resource. Uh, another one is uh, gcflearnfree.org. This is through the Goodwill Community Foundation. Also another one that is free. Do not have to have an account if you don't want to. You can just go in, onto their site and start using some of their resources. Um, this is geared a little more differently, more like life skills type thing. Um, the kind of people that the Goodwill um, Foundation would work with generally. Um, videos, apps, lessons. They have multiple languages, which is great. English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Um, and this is a list of just some of the things that they do um, um, through theirs. So uh, skills for today, adapting to change, personal finance, uh, job searching, so things like that. But then all over here on the left, all of the different Microsoft things, Office, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. So if you need to learn something for a job, if your own staff needs to learn something there um, and then you can see here I like at the upper left there they say I want to do whatever I'm not sure which category it is but I know what I want to do and they can guide you to the right um, course that might be for you um, there's um, here's their one for Excel it has a video you can see down there um, there's also um, just uh, PDFs of these different sessions that you can look through as well. So they've got different options depending on how you want to do your learning, which is great. If you if you learn really great from a video talking at you, if you prefer to read your own um, and, and, uh, steps through the education. Um, and another one we have here that I, I learned about, we actually did a show about this um, a while ago, Tech Boomers. This is specifically for, um, and they do say, older adults and other inexperienced technology users. This would be, Grandma wants to know what the heck is my granddaughter doing with that snap thing, snap picture thing that she uses, and I want to learn more about it. Or I want to do it myself. I want to be able to email better with my family. I want to be able to share photos of my um, trip to, um, you know, Alaska, whatever they want to do. Um, so it's very geared towards specifically older people who are trying to learn these things that are out there. Um, there's video tutorials, article tutorials. Um, and it's very trusted. All the people here are also experts. Same thing, do not have to create an account to use this one either, but you can if you want to, to keep track of things. Um, this is a screenshot of their main page, and they've got um, gathered things into some broad category: Shopping online, online entertainment, social websites, useful websites, and technology basics. So depending on what person wants to do. Um, and you can see these are some of the articles they've got written up there. So they've got some general articles just about things, and then they've got actual training that takes you step by step through how to use things. Um, and I will mention here, some of this, it may look a little, for those of us that know, a little clickbaity. The best seven sites to do this, the best what? However, it's not. These are actually articles written by the people at Tech Boomers. These are not pop you out to some bad clickbait site or anything. Um, they know that this is the kind of thing that um, older people may be looking for, so they've written some um, good articles about it. So this would be a good place to go to for safe, accurate, good um, information about all these things. And here's just an example of the Snapchat course, a little brief thing on the side about what it is, and then step by step, what is chap snap Snapchat? Is it safe and private? Review, how to use it? So you start with the basics and work your way through the course to learn um, whatever it is um, you're trying to learn. So all three of those are great free resources that I think all a library should be out putting out there. Um, even if you do have some pay ones, um, these are definitely can be helpful to your users. Um, and if you don't want to do or can't do the pay ones, I think between this, these three at least, you can get a lot of good information, um, education out there. So it's related to education. Yes. So um, 
and this is just one resource that we're going to show you, but uh, we really like it. Uh, many of you have probably heard of Zotero, which is a wonderful citation management tool um, that's especially used in academic libraries of all sizes uh, or academic institutions of all sizes. This is actually kind of a mini version to get people started. The reason I mention this is because a lot of you are from public libraries, smaller libraries, maybe small community college libraries, and you have people who are uh, new to being a student or they may be a non-traditional students. Um, you may have college, we have a lot of community college students coming to our public library and using us as their primary library just because of location, because they're doing distance learning. So we like to have a little bit of a tool to help them with that citation process. And again, Zotero is fantastic, it's very powerful. This is Zotero BIP, which is kind of a free, kind of low level Zotero to get you started. And you can do, Any and what's Zotero? great is you, I'm sorry? Mini Zotero. <laughs> It's a mini Zotero. So again, uh, you can just copy and paste URLs, ISBNs, even like Amazon and Google Books in there. So um, now it, it can then convert them into, I kid you not, there are 9,000 plus citation styles. This includes all the languages, but I'm like 9,000, do we really need 9,000 citation styles? This is a thing for me. Anyhow, uh, but they do, they get stored locally in your browser and then basically you can then take the whole thing and export them. So it's a, almost like a browser add-on. Um, and it does seamlessly export to Zotero, which is fantastic. Um, uh, just to give you kind of an idea, I basically took a bunch of my favorite children's books and kind of pop it in the ISBN there, just because I, I literally, this is like a one, this is like my one minute bunny. It's the one minute um, uh, citation. So basically you, I, I found a couple of articles on my favorite um, children's books and popped them in there and was, and you can add or remove whatever information. I put them in MLA style and bada bing, bada boom, as it were, uh, you suddenly get this, uh, all these, these books in a citation style. And then I decided, mm, I really wanna change that to APA and you can do that on the fly. Why anyone would wanna use APA, I don't know. I hate API, <laughs> but there we go. So suddenly they're now in APA style. And again, it can do this for, as I say, 9,000 plus citation styles, which is fantastic. And again, all of this is stored in your browser and can then once you kind of have it basically put together or you have a good start on it, you can then export that to, um, uh, Zotero and really do more deeper research. So if they're using Zotero at their institution, but they're mm -hmm. at your library just trying to get started, this is a great a great little tool to get them started. So that's it. Absolutely. And sometimes too, I know if the libraries open the better hours for someone than what the university or the college they're attending or their school, they might be coming to you because they have to. Yeah. And we have an mm -hmm. enormous number of distance learners who use our library because oh, they like yes. our library better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so project management. Um, as always oh, mentioning, they are doing a big project <laughs> of um, renovation, but you may yeah, need to pray for me. It's, it's, it's a 20-month <laughs> renovation. So. so you may have something like that. If you're lucky, you have to have a renovation, um, an addition on your library, um, a new building being built. Um, you need to keep track of things going on. Or if you're just doing a major um, event like your summer reading program and how do you track all of the 50 billion things that are going to be going on over that you know, three-month period period. Um, you can, there are ways to keep track of yourself, but there's some free project management resources out there. There are paid ones, there are companies that do this for you, but I found a couple of, um, actually a friend of ours told us about a couple of really good ones that are out there. Uh, Trello is one of them. Um, it's got, it's web-based, but it has both mobile and desktop apps. So as you are wandering around your renovated library, you can have something on your phone or tablet that you're tracking. Um, this is free. Um, unlimited, you can have boards about different things, uh, different lists of things, of stuff, steps that need to be taken, um, information and checklists for different staff to do what they need to do. This one is task focused, so it's based on um, the diff all the different tasks that you need to do make up your whole project. Um, so these, these, this, this, um, the two different resources I'm going to show you here is going to depend on how you might think and how you organize yourself, or how your particular project needs to be organized. Whether you'd use this one as a task focused one or the other one, I'm going to mention in a second here. Um, many of people do use whiteboards to take notes on or walls with little sticky notes of everything. This is similar to that. So if that's your way of doing things, this may be the one for you. Various stream numbers work together, easy drag and drop. I'll show you a picture here of a screenshot. This is uh, Tacos Tacos, who is working on doing some better promotion of their taco truck. Um, they So they've got the different resources, they've got their um, plans and, and goals and their financials and all their basic data about the, their business. And then um, things they need to do, things they're in the midst of doing and things that have been done and completed, checked off the list. And you can see there's little headshots of each of the staff people that are involved in each one and the status of it, how far along things are done. 
So um, you can keep track of, you need to build a bread or burrito, seven layers to success. They're gonna do a birthday event and then they're working on having a taco truck world tour and they finished up their focus group though for corn versus flour tortillas. So um, this is really good just to keep track of things and just move them along and just click and drag and move things along through the process here. The other service, uh, the other product is Asana. This is also web-based, has mobile apps. Um, this one is free for up to 15 people in a, on a team, 15 logins. Now, as we mentioned earlier, you people could share logins if necessary, but for mes most of our libraries, you're not going to hopefully have more than 15 people involved in the project unless you want to drive yourself or them crazy. <laughs> um, that's probably good. Uh, this one is project focused rather than task focused like Trello. Your teams are organized around the particular project that's being done. So if that's the way that you like to organize things or that's what you need to, this may be the one for you. Um, Similar, very similar to Trello. You see, we look at this, different tasks, different things that need to be done. This one I would think would be better for your more complex things like a, um, a library renovation. Um, Trello would be great for running uh, your summer reading program. Who all is involved, all the things you need to do from beginning to end. This one would be for more complex one. Also bringing in people from outside your organization like your subcontractors and your electricians and whatever if you're doing that can join in for this. Uh, this is what the Asana um, interface looks like. You can see they've got it based on how, when things need to be done, five weeks out we have to do these things, three, one, day of. Same kind of thing with the headshots of the different people involved in it and where they're at. So um, you can see the whole project as a whole here, this whole main project. Um, this one is their customer appreciation event and all the different things have to do with that particular project as opposed to Trello, which was we are this taco truck and we're going to be doing all these different things. Um, um, various things, not just one particular event. So those are the two different really good project management tools, free, easy, click and drag, really slick interfaces, um, get people to come in um, and you know, keep, you, keep you on track. All right, so I just want to mention here before we go on to our uh, last topic here, we I did just hit 11 o'clock central time here. Um, we started a little after 10, so that's okay. Uh, we will go as long as it takes to wrap everything up here with our presentation. Um, any questions or comments you have, please do um, put them into the question section here. We'll ask, you know, we can answer them for you. Um, any resources you have that you might want to share with us, put them in there, um, and we can um, talk about them as well. But I just want to let you know we're going to go until we're done here. So if you need to leave because you only allow an hour to watch our show this morning that's fine we are recording and you can always catch up and watch the rest of it later at your convenience and we just oh. have a couple a couple of minutes left so um yeah. Oh, yeah. if you can yeah. stick with oh, us no. please do yeah. plus plus there are kittens at the end and that's always important yes, you don't want to miss the, the kittens, the kittens at the end. <laughs> yes okay so um i'm going to just skim through this pretty quick because most of the stuff's pretty self-explanatory many of us do polls and surveys again i've just taken a whole lot of sessions on community engagement and part of community engagement has to be despite the fact that sometimes it makes us roll our eyes we have got to survey people we have to talk to people we have to ask them what they need and when they need it and how they need it um and so one of the things that for user experience surveys of any kind and i I mean like did you like your visit to the library today and like that's your only question you could um one of my ideas is to like stick it on an ipad and stick it on a stand and there's ways of just kind of locking some of these um tools that we're going to show you down to just a single um uh, survey and you basically just have them punch in their uh, answer and submit it and it shows up live what the answers are people really like those um just as long as you keep it short um so again that doing a survey at the actual point of service is a really good idea and not just on paper people really love to push buttons so let them push buttons <laughs> Okay, so uh, Doodle, we all know the Doodle. We've all used Doodle to schedule some crazy meeting none of us ever wanted to go to. Um, uh -huh. Obviously, if you have something internally in your library like Outlook, obviously use that. But if you're doing a meeting with outside entities or something where you're just kind of pulling a few random people together, Doodle's just great. I'm not even gonna worry about it. I mean, you've all used it. It does have a really nice um, app interface, so a mobile interface, mm -hmm. which is very nice. Um, I do like to have that. And again, it's basically for most of the stuff you need to do with it, it's free. They do have some upgrade options if you want to play around more with it. Um, I do want to talk about Survey Anyplace. Now, you're, you may be wondering why Survey Monkey isn't on here. Well, Survey Monkey has betrayed us. The monkey has betrayed us. We the monkey, monkey is the monkey. Yeah, we love the monkey, but the monkey is now fully for fee. So you and they've really jacked up their fees. Um, and a lot of libraries got very dependent on them and have you know 50 or 60 ongoing surveys that they use throughout the year. 
and now they're going to have to remake them somewhere. So I'm trying I'm trying to find some other options. Survey any place is rather nice. Surveys and polls, and they um when they started, their big deal was the fact that they're um, they had a mobile friendly responsive design uh, and that you could then embed them in your website, embed them in social media, embed them in other places. That's still the case. Um, obviously, lots of others have caught up, but that was their kind of their shtick uh, when they first started. Um, the data is exportable. You can put it into graphs. You can do whatever you need with it. Um, just again, just like with SurveyMonkey. Um, I, I think they have some really nice templates and interfaces. This is They do have some free options. There are some other fee-based options. They're not terrible in terms of price. Um, so if you're doing quite a lot, like let's say for the next year, you're doing, say, a 20-month renovation like we are, that you may need to actually do a whole lot of surveying of people just to keep them happy and make sure that you're getting feedback. That might be worth spending a little bit of money just for that year and then cut it off after that. Okay, so I want to show you real quick. Um, again, this is they do have a basic that is free. They gen it is genuinely free. It gives you some basic options, not 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 terrible. They're really pretty good. Um, one nice thing is they do have templates that we really like. And one of the things I like, so this was from ARSL, um, mm -hmm. which is like two presentations ago now. But one good. nice thing is, for instance, okay, this took me again. This is it, talk about my one minute graphics. So I took the AR, ARSL logo, and as I was building this little, you know, four que you know, one question thing with four answers, um, I uploaded the logo and said please match these colors that's something I really like about their template interfaces you can say please so, match these colors uh, which again can make things look more professional than say mm -hmm. I could do on my own so again that's a really nice thing um, let's go to the next so the uh, easy polls then is our last one here and again it's very basic it's not super pretty but it's super it's super easy um mm -hmm. and again it has android and apple apps so that can be really helpful for if you want people to be like you're at a big meeting you're at a big program and you want people to say do a quick poll so in fact we want you to open up your browser which we already know you have open because you're watching encompass live and we want you to open up um we're going to give you a URL in just a second. We're going to actually have you do one live. But here's like the kind of data that you get. You can basically get it. You can get it geographically for location tracking, um, assuming someone is providing that. Uh, you'll get a quick graph. We actually did a very um, unscientific but but very fine uh, poll about what's the best pet. Cats and dogs obviously came in vastly first. Uh, husbands did pretty well. Uh, and apparently, fish and birds got no love. No love. Yeah, for librarians fish and birds. do not have fish or birds for, for pets. It's, uh, well, this particular set of librarians did not. So this is yes. not a wonderful sample. Uh, <laughs> but pretty much cats and dogs pretty much won out. Um, so there was one a couple of chinchillas so it's all good all right so again that's just i was really just showing that to show you how some of the how some of the um, data shows up for you okay so now we're going to have you take a quick poll so if you could please go in your browser to tinyurl.com slash nc for encompass nc live poll yeah we'll give tiny you a couple of com slash nc live poll and then krista in a minute here is going to pull it up and we're going to refresh it to, and show your um answers so please do go live. Into like, yeah, like while you're live. doing that yeah if you have any questions comments type into the question section any other services or resources you want to share with us we're always looking for new ones to add to this presentation some of the things we have in here were as we mentioned told to us by other people that we didn't know about them um, at first on our own yeah, we're not proud. We're happy to give people credit for being like, yeah, oh, our friend told us about this really great resource and we went and played with it and loved it and added it. So, yeah, by all means, please um, uh, send us anything that you think might be interesting to other librarians. Because that's the other thing is we're sending, we, we do this presentation because we know that nobody has enough time to look at all of these. I mean, there's a few people whose job it might be, um, like, like Krista and I, but even we... Are, are like, oh, I hadn't even heard of that. That's fantastic. Let me go play with that and see see how it might tie into some of these other resources. Mm -hmm. And then also we, ha you know, we try to take the time to look at things like pri the privacy and terms of service and so forth to make sure that there's no hidden traps. Um, there's often very obvious traps that you need to be aware of, things like privacy, but, but that's why we kind of give you that caveat at the beginning. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a look and see if we got some answers here. So here is what it looks like when you go um, to, to the poll itself. And I can refresh it here, just say see results and see. Let's try it again. There we go. Yes, everybody Yay. learns something. We know awesome. some of you are lying, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> you make us so feel good. Right. So, but anyways, but you can see it's just, you know, it's a kind of thing where if you're doing an engagement program or like with your board, you know, or with friends, the friends program or something, and you're basically like, hey, you know, um, we just told you about these five things. Which of these interests you the most? Or, uh, you know, of the five things we just told you about, which interests you the most? And it's a great, it's a way to get quick feedback which is mm -hmm. kind of fun. And then they get to see the feedback, which can also help reinforce whatever it is you were trying to tell them. Yeah. No big deal, but it's, it's again, another tool that you can use to engage your community. Okay, and that's All that. Right. So let's now get kittens. back to the slides. Where are my slides? Time for kittens. Um, current, there we are. All right, so, yay. Of course, this is a library for librarian presentation. We have to have the kittens. This is Zipper and Monkey, who are no longer kittens. As we said, we've been doing this presentation for a while. Um, but uh, so all these tools we mentioned, as we said, they are free um, for you. But they are free as in kittens. You need to, you can get them for free and easy, no problem. But then you do have to take care of them. You do have to feed and water them and clean out their litter box. Um, and so these tools, you will have to, you know, research, look at them a little bit, do some investigating, figure out how you can use them. They will, it will take a little bit of time for you to um, make sure that it works for your particular library and your particular inst um, you know, situation. Um, but we hope we have weeded out the real, um, the the bad ones that we think work not at all or just cost too much so we don't even mention them so do keep that in mind that you will you know still have to put up in a little bit of your own time to um, use these resources for yourself and there is our contact information if you want to ask us any more um, or to share anything with us. And there is the link. This is the one you want to write down if you want to. As I said, the slides will be available and sent to you when we do have the archive up and ready to go. But um, that is the um, URL to go to to get all of the links. They are all listed in there. And you can... Um, so you don't need to write them all down yourself. So you can link to them all that way. And I believe already the yes. slides are up on your slide share, correct? Yes. I was ahead of the game today. Yes. Sometimes we're good at this. <laughs> um, so, all right. So that is um, our presentation. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? See, where's my question section here? Type into the question section there and let us know. We must we'll leave this slide clear. up here for a bit so you can get that links, those links and everything written down if you need to. Anything else you want to say while we're wrapping up, Louise? Nope. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Yeah, and, and seriously though, if you have other ideas, if you have, if you're like, hey, I had this experience with that tool you were talking about, we're always like to hear that because we, you know, we can only test them so far. So um, we'd love to hear if one of them was particularly useful or one of them was particularly awful. Uh, mm -hmm. All of that is useful to us. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I think that will wrap it. It doesn't look like anybody has any desperate, urgent questions they need to ask right now, and that's fine. Um, you can always reach out to us, either email or those are our Twitter um, handles there as well, um, if you do have anything. So thank you, everyone, for attending. And I am going to switch over to, should be, da, da, da. here we go, our um, website here. Whoop, over here. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, this you. is, yeah, and thank you, Louise, for joining me this morning on a, a kind of last-minute thing. As I said, we've been doing this presentation for a while, um, but there's always something new we love to learn, so yes. um, hopefully it was good for, for everybody. So uh, this is our Encompass Live website. Um, it, um, at the moment, if you use your search engine of choice and Google Encompass Live, we are the only thing called that on the Internet. Please, nobody else call any themselves this. <laughs> um, and uh, this is our page where you find, excuse me, our upcoming shows. But I wanted to show you, if you scroll down just underneath them, there's a link to our archived Encompass Live shows. This is where um, today's recording will be, hopefully by the end of the day, if uh, GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. Um, we will have a link to the show, and there will be on ours, there will be two links to the recording and to Louise's handout, uh, the handout that's on Louise's slide share. So you have all of that here. Uh, everyone who attended this morning and registered for today's show will be sent an email from me, and we'll also push it out onto our social media, we have Facebook, Twitter, the usual. Um, while I'm here on our archives, I will mention to you, um, we do have a search feature here in our archives now, as you can see, and this, there we go. 
um, has, you can search our entire archives, or just the most recent 12 months. This is because Encompass Live has now over 10 years worth of um, recordings here. Uh, Encompass Live premiered in January 2009, and we have all of our archives here. We are librarians. We save things for posterity, for historical purposes. So everything we've ever had on the show is here. Um, everything has a date, though, that tells you when it was originally broadcast. So you can either do your search to just most recent 12 months, if you have really current information, or do the entire archives. If you don't care, you just want to see what's out there. But just pay attention when you are watching a show to the date when it was originally broadcast. Because um, some things on here, some links may no longer work anymore, some services may no longer exist, some resources may have changed drastically since the original broadcast, um, but we will always keep them all up there as long as there's somewhere for us to um, have them out there for you. So we do also have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. So if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We have links to it from our main website. Um, we post reminders. Here's a reminder to log into today's show, posts about when the recordings are available, um, things we've done previously. So if you do like to keep up on things in, on Facebook, meh, two or three posts a week, nothing too overwhelming in there for you. So that will be it for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic uh, for October 16th is surviving and thriving as an accidental librarian. Um, Patrick Bodley, who is from the Idaho Commission for Libraries, will be joining us remotely to talk about um, you, you work in the library, but did you go to library school? Did you, but they didn't teach you the things that are coming to you and you're having to deal with? He's going to give you some tips and tricks for that. And this is one that we want really good audience participation. We want to hear from you um, about um, what are you do, you know, what have, what have you in, um, encountered um, in any, any areas that you do? Collection development, readers reference, outreach, advocacy, programming. So we want some interaction with some of our um, attendees for, for next week's show. So come with um, ideas to thought uh, and thoughts about um, how, are, how are you dealing with the fact that all these things that I'm having to do at my job were not taught in library school. And there's a lot of that, right, Louise? Sorry, yes. That's okay. But, I know. I put you on the spot. Many, many things, yes. I don't think renovations and being closed for however many weeks or months was anywhere in anything I was taught. <laughs> no. No. Or yeah. or worse, we're gonna be open while they're doing the renovations, which is even worse. Even so. more fun. Yes. Yeah. So yes. please do join us for that show and any of our other shows we have here. Um, I have th do have things all booked up through the end of December. I'm still waiting for just a few uh, descriptions for a few of the topics here. So look for any of these missing dates to be filled in hopefully very soon. Um, so that wraps up for today. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Louise, for being here with me this morning. You bet. And we will see you uh, next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.